Hello, children of God. My name is Joshua. I'm within Christ We Stand Ministry. Today, I'm going to be talking about finding contentment in, in God's providence. And what I mean finding contentment in God's providence is basically to be content with what God has provided for you. It could be in the season that you're in, being content with what God has provided for you. And not only has he provided these things for you, but what he is sustaining as well throughout your life. So providence, uh, what do I mean by providence? Providence is basically to be in the care of God. Providence means that everything that you have in your life, God is the one who provided it for you. And not only did he provide it for you, but every year, every second, every minute, every hour, it is God who sustains everything that you have in your life. So everything is from God. He provides it and he sustains it. This is what we call the providence of God, that God is the provider and he sustains everything in your life. And now this message is focusing for us to be content with what God in his sovereignty has provided for us in our lives and what he sustains as well. So in Matthew chapter 6, verse, verse 25 to 34, Jesus goes on to, to encourage the multitude that God in his sovereignty, he sustains creation, he provides everything for the birds, elders, all the animals, he feeds them, and he clothes them, and he protects them. So Jesus is encouraging them, how much more will our Heavenly Father do the same thing for us? Because these, the animals, creation, they don't ask. God does it anyway, because he is the creator. He sustains everything. So the Lord Jesus Christ, he's encouraging the multitude not to worry. God in his sovereignty, he's going to provide. He's going to sustain everything in their lives as well. But a lot of times for us, especially me, we look at our lives, we try to compare our lives to others' lives that they're living, and we feel discouraged. Sometimes in our marriage, we see another somebody else's marriage and we say, man, I wish my wife was more like her. Or sometimes even the, hus uh, the, the wife, she goes, man, I wish my husband was more like him. You see, and just altering that, saying that right away, what are you saying? You're saying that the will of God in your life is not perfect. You're saying that the marriage that God has for you, that God provided and gave you, you're saying it's not perfect. And by saying that, by saying you want, you wish your husband was like more like him, or you wish your wife was more like him, you're violating scripture. It's basically heresy. Because Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it tells us that the will of God is perfect. So whatever seasons that we're in, marriage, whatever seasons we're, we're in, it is God's will and it's perfect for us. So by you making this comparison, you're basically saying God's will for your marriage is not perfect. Sometimes we see somebody ministry and we're like, man, this person ministry is striving. Look at the members that they have, the congregation. Look at the events they're having. Look at their worship team and their equipment and all those other things. By making that comparison and wanting what they have, what you're saying, you're saying God's will for your ministry is not perfect. And again, this violates, basically goes against God's word. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says that the will of God is perfect. So by you making this comparison with your ministry and the other person's ministry, you're saying man of ministry is striving. Look at them. They have so many members. They have so many views. You're not content with God's providence. You're not content with what God he has provided for your ministry. You're not content with his sovereignty over your ministry as well. Other times what we do, we make comparisons with others' career. We look at somebody's career, we're like, man, this person, look at their career. Look at how great they are. Look at how much money they're making. They're able to take care of the family. But look at me, look at my career. I'm working a nine to five job. I'm not traveling, I'm not doing this, I'm not going places, I'm just stuck in this one place. It could be, you know, whatever job you're working, you're not content with God's providence because the job that you have, it is God who provided for you. And not only did he provide provided for you, but he's the one who sustains everything. So if you're not satisfied with the career that God has for you this season, you're violating Romans chapter 12 verse 2 again, which says the will of God is perfect. So you're saying God's will for your life in the season that you're in is not perfect. And that is a lie. Romans chapter 3 verse 4, let God be true, but every man a liar. And other times what happens, we look at somebody's family, we look at their family and we see our family. And we're like, Look at that person from the outside. We see it. We're like, man, look at that person's family. 
the kids look, man, the kids are gorgeous. It seems like they listen. And the kids, they're striving in life. They have career. And their children, they're off. And they're doing really well in life. And then you make that comparison with your family. And you're like, look at my family. We're not doing nothing. We're not moving anywhere. I want to encourage you. Don't say that. Don't make that comparison. Because <laughs> the season that your family is in, it is God who orchestrated that by the grace of God in sovereignty. So what we have to do, we have to be content with the with, with God's problems. We have to be content with where God has us in that season, that moment. We ought to be content. We can't be making these comparisons. We can't say, Lord, I wish I had what they had and covet, and covet in. Because what we're doing, we're saying God's will is not perfect for our life. And that is heresy. Because Romans chapter 12, verse 2, again, the word of God says that the will of God is perfect for our lives. In John, 1 John chapter, chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, the word of God says, do not love the world, all the things of the world. For anyone who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Verse, um, verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, it is not from the Father, but is of the world. In the world, verse 17, the world is passing away with his passions, but he who does the will of God abides forever. In verse 16, the word of God says, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, it is not from the Father, but it's of the world. Now, what causes this sin for us not to be content in God's providence for what he has provided for us is the lust of the flesh. The, these three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, these three things are the three roots of all sin that causes everyone to fall. These three things, they are the root of every sin that you see. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. So from the lust of the flesh, we covet, we see things that we want. We don't have this, so what we do, we try to do things, any means to get it. Even by sinning, we try to get it, and that is sin. That is sin. So the lust of the flesh, you see things that we covet. A great example is from 1 Samuel chapter 8. After all these years, after all these years, God brought the Israelites from Israel, brought them to their land and established them as a nation. Now all of a sudden, they're around the other nations, they're around them. What they started to do, they started to covet what they had. And what they had is a king. So when it starts to cover it, the lust of the flesh, 1 John chapter, chapter 2, verse 16, the lust of the flesh. When they try to cover, cover those things, what did they tell Samuel? We want a king to rule over us. And this thing, it displeased Samuel. Because Samuel said, how are you not content with God's providence? God has been king for you. God took you out of Israel. Read on 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 9. Samuel go on to plead with the people. God has did, took you from Egypt, from bondage, from the house of bondage. God brought you through the wilderness. Your fathers, he sustained them in the wilderness. He has established you as a nation, as Israel, his people. And now you don't want God to reign over you. Instead, you're demanding a king. And you don't want God who is sovereign to be your king. And then after he told them, he told them, he said, how can you do this? And he told them, he went to God, he inquired of the Lord. And the Lord said, Samuel, hear the voice of the people. It, it does please you, but it pleases me. They don't want me to be their king, but hear them, tell them the actions of their king once you anoint him. And then Samuel, he told them the actions of their king. They still demanded one king because they were not content with God's providence. Why? Because they covered after things that they wanted that they didn't have and that is a king it's the same thing with us in Christianity. We covet a lot of things, like the Israelites. We covet those things around us. And by coveting what happened, we become discouraged with what we have. We say, Lord, this is not this is not perfect. I want more. And we commit heresies. We're sinning because we're saying the will of God is not perfect. And that is a sin. Do you see that? So covet, we shouldn't covet, we should be content with God's providence, whatever he has in us in, whatever season. I want to encourage you with Philippians, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Here's what the word of God says. The word of God says this. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Do you see that? 
So what we have to think about, we have to think about the goodness of God in our lives. Instead of coveting things, looking at things that other people have and not being and being discouraged with what we have in our lives, we should think about what God in his providence, what he has provided for us and how he's still sustaining us. We should thank God for his grace, the grace of God, by the grace of God. We should thank him for his mercy, for his truth. We have roof over our heads. We have a job that paid the bills. We have clothes on our backs. You see, the Lord, he's providing. It's not how we want it, but it's how he wanted in his wisdom and sovereignty by his grace, his faithfulness by his grace and his love. You see, so we got to meditate on all the things that God has done for us in Christ Jesus, from where he took us from, from the house of bondage, from sin, and how he saved us, and how he called us to be his people, and how in his sovereignty over salvation, he sustained us. He's given us the grace, the strength to persevere, to strive, this good work that he started within us in Christ Jesus. He is bringing it to completion, and he is providing for us too. Our physical needs, spiritual needs, emotional needs, financial needs as well, all according to his riches in glory. Do you see that? So we got to be content in God's providence by the grace of God. We got to be content. Now let's look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 or 29, I'm going to read. But before I get to that, I want to ask this question, of course. Why will God, why would God put weaknesses in our lives? Why would God, you see, like I have a career, say I work a nine to five job, but here's my friend who's, who's a CEO of a company and they're traveling and they're making like six figures. And I look at their lives and I'm like, man, look at John. John is making so much money than me. John is living such a wealthy life more than me. And God is providing for John, but God is also providing for me. So by looking at um, John's life and coveting what he has from the lust of the flesh, First John chapter, chapter 2, verse 16, I'm not content with God's providence. I'm not content with what God has. He's providing for me. I want more, and I see his life. And what, what happens? I'm discouraged. I'm discouraged. I'm not praising God. I'm not content with the will of God. And I'm like, no, this. I want more. So Romans chapter 8 it says, by the grace of God, it says, the Lord, God, he caught in his sovereignty. The Lord causes all things to work together for the good of the believer who love him, who is called according to his purpose. So everything that you have in your life, everything, the job, everything that you have, your marriage, your ministry, your family, even your activities, everything, it is caused by God. Even the weaknesses that you have in your marriage, the weaknesses you have in your ministry, the weaknesses you have in your career, the weaknesses you have in your family, it is orchestrated by God. And why would God cause that to happen in your life? It's because he... Let me read verse 29. I'm jumping the, the gun. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So why would God cause these weaknesses to happen in your life? Because God want to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. By not having these riches and these things that other people have, you'll be content with what he has. And by being content with what he has, you're going to show love. You're going to show mercy. You're going to show grace. You're going to show kindness. You're going to show self-control. Do you see that? You're going to even self Control, controlling your anger and jealousy and you'll show love all the more. Although this person is prospering than you in life, but you still love this person. You still pray for that person and your character in Christ Jesus is being built and that's what God is concerned with. God wants you to be like Jesus. So however God can make you to be like Jesus, he will cause many things to happen in your life just so that you may be conformed to the image of his son. That's why God in his sovereignty, he caused everything to work together for your good, the good of the believer so that you may be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Now, with that being said, let's go over the bridges now. Let's go over marriage. Why will God in his sovereignty, you see, why will God in his sovereignty cause weaknesses to be in your marriage? Because God wants you to be like his son, Jesus. You say, well, brother Josh, how? Well, let's look at it in details. Say I have my wife, and my wife, she's not patient. She's just... She wants things right away. Say, I have my wife. She's not really submissive. She likes to do things her way. When I say something, I make a decision. My wife, she challenged it. And I'm like, why? God, why have you given me this difficult wife who cannot submit to me? Why have you given me this difficult wife who is not patient? Why do I have to pull up with her foolishness? 
But then that's when God will come back again. To Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that everything in my marriage, he is causing it for my good so he can conform me to the image of Jesus Christ. But my wife not being patient, I will show her patience. My wife not being merciful, I will show her mercy. My, my wife not being graceful, I will show her grace. She's not submitting. That doesn't mean I don't love her. I love her even more. Because why do we love? Because Jesus Christ, he first loved us. So I shouldn't wait for my wife to show me those qualities before I love her before I, I, I lay my life down for her. I got to do it regardless. Do you see that? So by the difficulties of my wife's character, God is using my wife's character to conform me to the image of his son. Do you see that? He is conforming me to the image of his son that my character will be built in Christ Jesus. And my wife will see that. She'll see my love for her, my grace for her, my mercy for her. She'll say, wow, how can I be this, this, this stubborn in my, in my husband, Josh? He still loves me. And by my character, the Lord will use my character to convict my wife so she can submit to me, so she can love me, so she can honor me in the home, and so she can be supportive of me. God would do that work. But God first, he orchestrated that weakness so I can be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And the same thing go for the wife. The same thing go for you, ladies. You see your husband, you're like, you're like, why does my husband doesn't like me? He, he, he doesn't even love me, he doesn't spend time with me. We don't even go out anymore for, for walks to places just to eat out. We don't even do that no more. We don't even have chemistry in our marriage. Why, why, why? And then the, <laughs> the foolish wife in her heart, she will say, since my husband is not showing me love, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna harden my heart. I'm not gonna obey him. I'm not gonna submit to him. I'm not gonna honor him in the home. I'm not gonna be supportive of him. Any, any, uh, any, I'm not gonna be supportive of him either. So what there is, there's war in the home. The wife against the husband, the husband against the wife. But if a godly woman will see that and she'll say, God is using my wife, my husband, so he can conform me to the image of Jesus Christ. Although my husband doesn't love me, I'm still going to respect him. I'm still going to submit to him. I'm still going to honor him in the home. Do you see that? That mindset, even though he's not loving you, but still submit to him. Because Ephesians chapter chapter 5, verse 22 to 33, it says that, uh, uh, wives, we are called to submit to your husband. It doesn't matter. There's, there's no... There's no requirement that God gives in the Bible for your husband to hit check marks in order for you to submit to him. The word of God just says submit. And likewise, husband, the word of God just say love your wife. So you see that wife. When you see the difficulties in your marriage, the difficulty in your husband, he's not loving you. He's not spending time with you. He's not even like... Like, he seems like the chemistry, the connection is not even there anymore. It doesn't mean you should walk away from him, but even more, love him, submit to him, submit to him, um, have, a, have a gentle spirit. And the Lord will use your character. The Lord will use your godly ways to convict your husband. And by seeing your godly ways, being convicted, he's going to come to his senses and say, wow, he's going to appreciate you. He's going to say, even though I've been foolish in my ways, even though I've been deceptive in my ways as well but my wife has still submit to me my wife still respects me my wife still honors me look at how my wife is still supportive of me and he's gonna be amazing he's gonna change and then by just that that um that scenario god is using your character and his character by the grace of god to conform both of you to the image of jesus christ so you see that so we gotta have to be content in god's providence if your marriage is not going well pray and do what the bible says submit submit uh wives how do you submit to your husband by respecting him in the home by honoring him in the home and by being supportive of him and in everything that he does and husbands as well love your wife how do you love your way you give your life you lay your life down for her you put her first in everything you love her you pull her first you just give her your time you give her everything you put her first by the grace of god god first right and then your wife and then you know the children and then ministry and everything goes on by the grace of god but all these weaknesses is orchestrated by god to conform you to the image of his son let's look at ministry by, uh, by the grace of god so we may see our ministry and see another person ministry and we see this person ministry is striving this person getting so many views so many members and their ministry is growing but then we see our ministry we're like 
My ministry isn't going anywhere. What am I doing? And then we're not content with God's providence because God is the one who provided everything. The members, everyone for people to come to your church, attend your ministry. It is God who brings them. It is God who draws them by the grace of God. God is the one who does everything. So by seeing your ministry, not it may not be a lot of people, it may not be, you may not be getting a lot of views and all those other things, or you know, your equipments may not be a high, high, high tech quality and all of that. But you see this other person ministry, they have everything, and you're not content with God's providence. You're like, I want what they have. You're coveting, and you're not content. And by you not being content with what you're saying, you're saying God's will for you is not perfect. And what you're saying, that's heresy. Because Romans chapter 12, verse 2, again, it says that the will of God is perfect for our lives. So instead of you coveting and trying to trying to be like this person's ministry, trying to even be better than this person's ministry, thank God that God is using their ministry to save souls. Thank God that God is using their ministry to draw people onto him. That God is using the ministry to draw people into Christ. Thank God for that brother and pray for that brother and pray for his family. Pray for his ministry and you and your ministry as well. Ask the Lord. Say, Lord, how can I impact more people? Lord, please, please uh, um, use me, Lord. Use my ministry. Even though we don't have this, we don't have that. But Lord, I've seen your glory. I've seen your goodness. Thank you for providing everything that I have. And be content and be faithful with whatever the Lord has in your heart. Whatever mission the Lord has called you to. Whatever thing that the Lord has set on your heart do it with all of your heart by the grace of God and be content in God's providence because everything that you have in the state that you're in God is the one who provided that thing for you so be content with your ministry and don't don't try to covet other person others ministry and also to about career I said this before but I'm gonna say it briefly Say there's a doctor who's making a lot of money and I'm just working a regular job. And I see this doctor and we're friends, went to the same high school, but this person went to college and they're really prospering their career. And then I see their, their posts on, on social media, they're taking trips, this and that, they're driving a fancy car, they just bought a house and they're married. And I see my life, I'm not married, I don't have a I don't have a fancy house, I don't even have a house, I don't have a I don't have a fancy car, and I'm just working a regular job. So by us making that comparison with that person, with our best friend career what we're saying we're not content with, with god's problems with what he has provided for us and we're coveting we want what they want it is not god's will you see that so how we have to look at this that every weakness that god has every weakness in your life it is caused by god and is using those weakness to conform you to the image of jesus christ he is working all those things to work together for your good so you can be like jesus so instead of you coveting what they have the right mindset to have is to thank God for that brother. Thank God that you're doing good and pray that it get close to the Lord and focus on your life and say, Lord, I may not have this. I may not have that. I may not be married. I may not be having uh, working a working a six figure job. But Lord, as I have this time, as I'm single, help me to serve you. Help me to set my heart on you. Lord, what can I do to advance your kingdom? What can I do to minister? What can I do to go around and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? How can I be involved in a church so you can use me as a vessel? Lord, how can my life glorify you? Because once I get married, there will be limitations. And once I start working big corporate, corporate jobs, there will be limitations to what I can do for your kingdom. But now that I'm single, now that I don't have those big corporate jobs, how can I serve you? and bring you glory that's got to be our mindset you see um matthew chapter 6 verse 33 seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and everything else will be added on to you you see so that's got to be our our mindset our our career as if we're not there let us not be jealous you know wanting what others have but let us be content with what god has provided for us in his sovereignty, as we abide in his providence, in his care, everything he provides and sustains, let us pray that, that the Lord will open up our eyes, that we'll, we'll be content. And even sometimes we see a person, family, say, me and my best friend, we grew up. My best friend now, he has a family, he has a house, he has a really good job that pays the bill, and he's doing really well in life. But look at my life. I'm not married. I don't have a house. And I don't, you know, have, you know, something good. You know, I don't even have children. And then we become so depressed because we're not content with the season, the state that God, he have us in. You see? 
And by doing that, it's heresy. Because we're saying God's will for us is not perfect. And we're coveting our friend's family, what they have wanted to. So what we do, we try to do things out of the will of God to get that. And by doing that, we are sinning against God. You see? We're sinning against God. So this message overall, brothers and sisters in Christ, I really, really want to encourage you. Don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged if you don't have a, a X, Y, and Z. Don't be discouraged. The season that you're in, it is God who have you in that season. You're in God's providence. As the word of God says, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse verse um. Verse 25 to 33 to 34, the Lord said, God, he sustains creation, everything in creation. He's the one who provides it. He sustains it. Creation, the trees, the grass, the animals, he provides for them. He makes sure they live. The seasons, see how we have rain comes down, the sun comes down as well. It is God who's in control of all those things. So that God can remember to do all these things for creation. How much more for us whom he died for? How much more for us when we ask him? How much more will he do for us as well? Well, but the thing is, God have you in that season because if us is because it is his will. He have you in that season because he have those weaknesses in your life. He have been taking you there to where you want to be yet because he's establishing your character. He wants you to be Christ-like. He wants you to be like Jesus. So he's causing everything in your life to happen for your good, both good things and bad things. It is God who causes them, and God is orchestrating them to work for your good. You see? So find a contentment in the providence of God. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's really tough. Like <laughs> for me, sometimes it's like up and down, right? Sometimes I'm like, man, I wish I had this. I wish I had that. But then I just got to remind myself, this is a season. This is not a permanent state. And not just that, but what can I do to advance the kingdom of God? What can I do to be more like Jesus in the season that I'm in? I may not have X, Y, and Z, but the things that I have, Lord, please open my eyes that I may be content with what I have. Please open my eyes, Lord, that I may be, um, that I'll be satisfied in your providence because this is your will for me. Whatever season you're in, it's the will of God for your life. Whatever season it is. So going back to family, somebody family is doing well. Their kids graduated. They're giving in marriage. They have houses and your friend. They're having grandchildren and all the other things. Try to be the best version of a father or a dad to your family. Love your kids. They may be difficult, but still love them. Show them love always. You see, pray for them, try to help them, try to understand life. And although they're not perfect, but still maintain your relationship with them. And don't get angry at them. Don't cut them off. Cut your relationship off for them because they're stubborn. Because it is God who have you in that season. And that weakness that you're experiencing in your family life, it is orchestrated by God. And God is using that so you can be Christ-like, to be Christ-like, to show grace, mercy, and love to your family. Even though they're not showing those things to you back. And likewise, with marriage, with career, with friendship, with family, all those things, love, mercy, and grace. God wants you to show in those relationships. God wants you to show in those areas so that you may be conformed. Although they're not showing it back to you, but God still wants you to show it so that you may be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So overall, to wrap everything, be find your contentment in the, in the in the providence of God, and remember, like we said, um, in Philippians chapter chapter four, verse eight, the Word of God said, "Whatever is is good, whatever is noble, whatever is praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Whatever is of good report, meditate on these things. Meditate on the goodness of God, where the Lord has took you from. Meditate on the works of God, His grace, His mercy, His truth, His love, everything that He has done for you, the testimonies that Jesus." has done for you. Meditate on those things. Remind yourself of the promises of God. Remind yourself of, of all the wonderful works, the signs and wonders that the Lord has performed in sovereignty in your life. Remind yourself of these things and be comfort and be encouraged in these things and find your contentment in God's providence. Find your contentment in the season that God has you in. You may not have X, Y, and Z, but the state that you're in, you're content and you give glory to God. That's how it ought to be. That's how it ought to be. Thank God for his salvation, for him turning your heart of stone, giving you a heart of flesh, taking you from your filthy lust, from the abominations that you did, Jesus Christ, in the sovereignty, reconciling you with the Lord, being your mediator, your advocate. Hmm? 
being all those things for you by the grace of God, propitiation for your sins, being all those things for you. Thank God for that. And just keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, what he wants for you, what he has for you as well. And don't turn to the left, don't turn to the right, but just keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, what he has for your life. And by faith, everything that the Lord is doing in your life, focus on it, do it with all your heart, and ponder it, and do it for the rest of your life by the grace of God. And be faithful by God's grace. So, find your contentment in the grace of God. In the, in the providence of God. Be content with the state that God has you in. Everything that God has provided for you and sustained for you, be content. Thank you for watching. Take care and be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen.